we coined the pro, uh, project Sargassum Cleanup, um, which in a very, you know, one sentence, it's, it's a feasibility study in terms of the clearing and the harvesting and the processing of sargassum and doing the sequestration of uh, the carbon at the same time. Um, the program for tonight, as Sven has already briefly explained, uh, we'll dive into a quick intro in what this study is all about. Then we have the presentations for each of the work streams we're working on. We want to do that very uh, short and then have a, a brief question, which is all part of the recorded session. And then if there's more questions or more elaborate explanations to be done, we go into that next bit uh, for a more in-depth uh, discussion on that. Then we'll have a short break as always, which should be round off the full hour for uh, the official part of this uh, Double Nature talk. And then afterwards, uh, we can have drinks and talk uh, more about this project and you know, uh, try and visit maybe some ideas or whatever comes up. Um, this is sort of the background of climate cleanup. Seaweed is a big, big part of the potential of sequestering the 1500 gigatons of uh, carbon we want to suck out of the uh, of the, uh, the system, of the, uh, the ecosystem. And so when looking at that, we, we started to combine things as already t uh, Sven has explained, the uh, Tim Flannery idea of sinking seaweed. Uh, and so why not having a seaweed which is actually causing a big, big problem at the moment uh, all the way, and we'll learn more about that today, all the way from the Gulf of Mexico onto West Africa. And, and so, uh, a, a natural phenomena which we want to turn into a, uh, a solution from being a problem. And we'll learn more about that today. Um, this is just an overview of the sightings to date in 2020, where you can see all those red dots where sargassum is causing problems. And that's, that's really a, a painful uh, issue for, for both nature as well as for uh, the humankind and tourism and industry and everything uh, which is related to that. Um, this feasibility study, I don't want to go too deep into it, but we said, okay, we want to fix this problem. We got a grant from the Nether Netherlands Maritime Land Organization, and effectively, we tried to fix this uh, problem using both a ecological and a, a technical, maritime technical view into how can we harvest the seaweed in the best way possible, and what options are there to either uh, process it on land or to sink it at sea and what kind of infrastructure is needed. So more about that, the whole uh, idea is posted here in the URL below. Uh, you'll get all that uh, later on, of course, uh, as part of the distribution of this presentation. Um, and so in doing this, we say, okay, we, we don't, all know about this, but we need a big team. We need everybody uh, available to actually help us out. And, and that team together uh, is what you see here. Uh, we have people from very local uh, where they are actually working at Bonaire uh, with the Sargasso problem uh, huh. and, and bringing a lot of knowledge on the ecosystems there. Uh, we have the, uh, the people from Aruba, which are sort of from the economic side, what is actually in terms of infrastructure needed. Uh, we have Joost Wouters from the seaweed company, who's a seaweed entrepreneur working with a completely different seaweed, but knows a lot about everything related to that. And then we work with the, the, the offshore companies, Van Oort, also listed Royal uh, IHC, um, who, who are providing the technological maritime knowledge to, to, to build the solutions we come up with. Uh, together with Port of Amsterdam, which is our home base for climate cleanup. And um, last but not least, I would say the, the research uh, for the University of Portsmouth and Wageningen University provide a very deep knowledge base and a lot of experience. I'm very happy to, uh, to have uh, Dr. Ian Handy here today um, and, and one of the, uh, the PhD students, Dan Page, who is who's working on his... Uh, the work together with Climate Cleanup for his thesis, and Dr. Federica Regazzola, who can't join us tonight, but you know, a vast body of knowledge and deep research going on there. So very excited to be able to present this team. And of course, we'll have Fons Janssen also from Wageningen University, 
which is actually for climate cleanup, the first intern we have. So that's another first as well. So really, really excited to have everybody here listed. Um, with that, that's my brief introduction. Uh, Bram Geers uh, is also part of our team and he will be doing a short overview uh, of, of the sargassum seaweed in terms of the scope of the problem, what's going on. Um, we will have Dr. Ian Handy explaining about the, the research he's doing, the impact of the sargassum seaweed. Dan Page is working on the deep sea dynamics. What happens if you actually are willing or looking at sinking it to four or five kilometers deep? Um, we have Elko Lehmans, uh, maritime expert working on the maritime and the infrastructure angle. And Fons is doing the biotech findings and valorization effort as part of this study. So full house. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to give the slide, the share to Fons, or to Bram, sorry, to Bram to do his bit. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Let me Jan, just leave that. And if you can start sharing, Bram, that's good. Yes. Okay. And um, just, just to let you know, um, if there's any questions, please put them in the chat. We try to answer them while uh, moving um, and having this session. Um, and if you want to raise a question, uh, maybe raise your hand and let us know. We can bring that in, but we like to really, as we have a lot to share, keep the presentations short and, short and sweet. Yeah, uh, it doesn't go into full screen. We can see it like this, Bram, so go ahead. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Bram Geers. I'm an ecologist involved in this project, and I will give a quick overview of uh, sargassum. Yeah. It's a bit annoying like this. Um, okay, but uh, as you can see here, these are the two species uh, involved in the, uh, in the in this project. Uh, and on the left, you can see uh, Sargassum natans, and on the right, you can see Sargassum fluitans. Uh, and they're both brown seaweeds, and they're characterized by these uh, small balls they have. They're full of air, uh, and which is keeping them afloat. So the whole life cycle of Sargassum, and it's pretty uni unique, is spent afloat in the open ocean. Um, and uh, this is uh, the Sargassum Sea, and this is where the Sargassum seaweed lives. And in the green area, uh, that, that's called the Sargassum Sea. Uh, here you see the United States, the Caribbean area, Brazil, and, and Africa to the right. Uh, and all these uh, black area, arrows, they uh, indicate ocean currents. Uh, and as you can see in the, in the green area, they form a kind of gyre. So all the, the, the streams are circling around. So everything that's afloat will stay in this area. And that's exactly what happens with sargassum. So all the sargassum is uh, accumulating in, in this area. And normally in the open ocean, uh, it's pretty much devoid of life. There's not much fish uh, around and it's uh, mostly empty. Uh, but in here, it's a totally different uh, picture. So there's a lot of sargassum in the area, and it's providing providing food, shelter, um, uh, something to breathe on, something to lash on. So it's teeming with life here, uh, and it's really biodiverse. And it's also the breeding ground for a lot of commercial fish, among them the European eel. The European eel, the, the paling, it swims every year from Europe to this place uh, to breed. And also in terms of climate, this is a very interesting area because of all the global uh, carbon that is sucked out of the atmosphere yearly by all life on, on land as well as on the ocean by plants and by algae and seaweed, 7% of that is drawn down and sequestered by the Sargasso Sea. So that's relatively r very huge portion. It's, it's more than the, a couple of times more than the Amazon uh, rainforest. Um, so it's a very interesting area and it's, uh, this is not a problem. Let, let's be clear about that. This is a good thing. Uh, this is the natural habitat that's going on for ages like this. This is what we actually need to protect. But um, last decade, last 10 years or so, it, uh, it has changed. So um, 
Uh, this is a time lapse of the satellite view here. You can see uh, Florida and Brazil and Africa again. Uh, and in, in this is a time series of 2000 to 2018. Uh, and in the first 10 years, there's not much going on. All these uh, colory dots you see on the screen is sarcasm uh, growth. Um, and um, one of the hypotheses is that uh, deforestation in the, the Amazon area and, and increase of, of farming has caused nutrients to run off at, in the Amazon uh, River, which you see here in, uh, in the coast of Brazil, and it's feeding um, all these nutrients to the open ocean. And oh, somehow the time lapse stopped. Maybe you can use the next slide to show the... Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, you can see after a couple, uh, a couple of years, you can see the, uh, the seaweed really uh, blooming. And also one go to the next slide. Oh. Yeah, here it goes. Yes. Okay, this is a picture of 2018. And this is, illustrates well. This is, uh, before you saw very little uh, small uh, dots. And here you can see a, a big plume from Africa uh, all the way to the Caribbean. Um, and it's, it's, it's a huge amount. It's 20 megatons of biomass. And if you imagine that, it's about one meters wide, one meters high, and then half the circumference of Earth. So that's a, a used coastline you can uh, inundate uh, with that. Uh, and it's causing all these troubles along the north, uh, uh, north of South America coast and the Caribbean area and, and Mexico. Uh, and it's washing ashore on these beaches. Um, and here, this picture illustrates this very, very well. All this, uh, th this is the coastline here. Uh, and this is all sargassum and the front brown part is degraded uh, decaying sargassum uh, and the thing is it it's really starts to smell once it decays uh, and it's so bad that it's, it exceeds health limits for uh, working with it with the material it's so bad the smell is so bad that you will get health problems from it uh, and also the fisheries have trouble with it fish populations are threatened by the sargassum um, and in the front, you see uh, a, a young mangrove forest, which is smothered by these uh, sargassum inundations. And our marine ecologist, Ian Handy, will talk more about that. So uh, there's really something we need to do, and you will especially learn that later by the uh, uh, story of uh, Ian Handy. Um, so we need to clean up, but how can we do it in a good way? What infrastructure do we need? Uh, and how to clean it without having ecological damage. So Ilko will talk something about that. Uh, and then what to do with the biomass that's coming there. So Fons will talk about that. And then there's another thing. Uh, in the Sargassum Sea, naturally it sinks off, it goes to the deep sea, uh, and that way a lot of carbon is sequestered. So uh, Daniel, um, is an ecology student and he will tell something about uh, the ecology of sinking off the material and maybe there's a way to mimic the situations of the Sargasso Sea that we can sink it off and have profits for climate and reducing the damage Sargassum is uh, doing. Uh, so thank you. Um, and then we can give the word to uh, Ian, I think. Yes, if you can uh, stop your share and then we can hand yes. over the share to uh, to Ian. Okay. So, good evening everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to meet you all and be here. So, what I'm going to do now is, is echo actually what Bram was talking about and talk about the impacts of sargassum to the coastal waters of the Caribbean, particularly Mexico. Um, in Quintana Roo, the state of Quintana Roo. So what I'm going to do is talk about uh, the research that myself and uh, our team at Portsmouth have been doing 
And again, what I'm going to do as an introduction is echo some of what Bram's been talking about in terms of the actual Sargasso Sea. As we know, we don't want to eradicate that. We need the Sargasso Sea because it's very important in the carbon cycle, particularly in the marine environment, because it equates to about 7% of the carbon cycle going down to the deep ocean. So it's very significant in the carbon transport. However, as Bram was talking about with the small Sargasso Sea, which is off the northeast coast of Brazil, which has been forming since the last 10 years, what that's been doing is big swathes of sargassum have been reaching the Caribbean coastlines and smothering the important nursery areas. So what we wanted to do was look at the impact of that and the significance of that to the coastal community structure. Okay, So what we wanted to do was uh, look at the impact of the carbon dynamics of seagrass ecosystems and of course of the coastal quarries and the communities within those nursery areas. So it's very important that we maintain the biodiversity and the carbon dynamics of those ecosystems because of course they're very important uh, ecosystem and carbon sinks as well of course. So well, what we want to do is maintain, uh, shall we say, the nursery areas of the sargassum but in the deep ocean areas where it's supposed to be for for example large pelagic fishes so tuna fish sailfish and marlin all of those things we utilize that as a nursery area but in the coastal areas we need our seagrass ecosystems so here we have an image here this is uh, an image taken in solomon bay where we work in the, Quint uh, in the state of Quintana Roo in Mexico. So as you can see, we have this beach car sargasso mats, which is about uh, 2,500 meters cubed of sargasso per kilometer of coastline. So it's a huge amount. And the darker areas is where the sargasso is actually decaying, okay? And the areas, the lighter brown areas, are still floating. But what it's doing is cutting out the available sunlight. And we're going to go into a bit more detail later on. So here we have Solomon Bay here. As you can see, my cursor here, I'm taking that over Solomon Bay. And there is big swathes of sargassum uh, in the bay itself. And as you can see with this Google image here, there's this leachate that's going out and washing out into over the seagrass beds and onto the coral reefs. Now this leachate is very toxic. It will create uh, uh, tissue loss disease on the hard corals. It's very toxic to the fish, the fish will die. And of course, it's very bad for the carbon cycle of the uh, seagrasses. And the image below here, what you can see here, are a couple of local lads and what they're doing is uh, um, putting sargassum in wheelbarrows and what they do then is uh, take that sargassum and take it to adjacent mangroves where they dump it and what's happening is of course is that they're kind of out of the frying pan and into the fire because they're releasing all of this uh, uh, decaying organic matter into the mangroves and of course the leachate then is then retained within the mangroves and damaging those mangroves, because mangroves, of course, are a huge important carbon sink as well, because mangroves will sequester up to about five times the amount of carbon as a, a tropical rainforest. So it's damaging those ecosystems as well. So here we have some more images. Here we have Dr. Federica Ragazzola here. This is when we were, were recording our data and collecting our data. So Federica here is in her element, of course, where she's happiest working with algae. And what she's doing here is recording uh, the level of dissolved oxygen underneath this sargassum mat. And these are a couple of images on the right of the screen here. And what these images are showing in Solomon Bay here, the large uh, 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 washed up mounds or mountains, if you will, of sargassum on the coasts then you can see the floating sargassum going out to sea as well. So all of this sargassum sits within the bay 
for months on end up to about six to eight months of each year and it decays and it rots and it changes the ecosystem. So here we have a, a nice colorful map of where we work. So here we have the coastal area of Quintana Roo, the state of Quintana Roo in Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. And we have our sites. So here we have Solomon Bay highlighted in the red circle and we have Half Moon Bay and Yao Cool Bay. So we had three sites that we wanted to look at. Now, Half Moon Bay, where I'm drawing my uh, laser pointer over, is north of Solomon Bay. Solomon Bay had lots of sargassum in it, okay? Now, it's very rich in seagrass habitat, and it has lots of different coral species with lots of fish. Now, the problem is the sargassum is invading those ecosystems in Solomon Bay, and it's a very low wave energy environment, and it just sits in there. Now, with Half Moon Bay, we do see some sargassum washing in, but it's a very high, high energy environment, so there's lots of mixing of water, and the sargassum doesn't sit there for very long, and in the Yao Cool Lagoon, we don't get any sargassum at all. So what we did was have these three different ecosystems um, and very different in their, their hydromorphology in terms of the, the water transport. So in Solomon Bay, lots of sargassum. As you can see, areas here in the last figure of the map where we have lots of sargassum and areas that are quite healthy. So we had comparisons within Solomon Bay and we also had comparisons between sites. So what I'm going to do, uh, I, won't, I won't labor this too much. I'll just talk about some data. And these data, in actual fact, guys, are published at the moment. And so we're going to be publishing these uh, very soon, in actual fact. So this is kind of hot off the press, if you will, of, of new data that we're going to be publishing within the next couple of weeks. So what we have here are a range of histograms or bar graphs. Now, I'm just going to highlight some graphs in red. Now, the graphs in red are areas that are affected by sargassum, okay? And what we did was put groups of animals into functional groups. So we had algae, we had coral, we had seagrass, and we had fish. So we had four broad functional groups, okay? Now, this was in Solomon Bay. Now, within Solomon Bay, where the sargassum is impacted, this is the area in the red, the only functional groups that we found in any significant volume was algae, okay? Now, if you look at the dotted line, this signifies what we call community structure or community evenness. Now, if you have a high dominance of one species and very low dominance of another, you have a very uneven community. Now, if we look at the graphs that are in yellow, so, so rather than these red bar graphs, but the yellow ones, these are areas in Solomon Bay that has sargassum in it, but away from the sargassum impact. And what you can see is not only is there are, there's, a, there's a more even community structure, but there's a greater number of functional groups away from the sargassum. So in other words, there's a higher biodiversity and a higher proportion of functioning organisms away from the sargassum. Okay, so we looked at this a bit deeper because we now know we have concrete evidence to say that the sargassum is actually impacting the community structure, which means it's impacting what we call the habitat complexity of the ecosystem, which then alters the community dynamics in terms of the flow of energy going through the ecosystem. So here we have some other data. So what I'm showing you here in this graph here, I'm highlighting with a laser pointer, this dotted line is temperature. So this is water temperature here. Now, in areas where we found the sargassum, water temperature on average was three degrees Celsius higher. Okay, so it was warmer. 
So as you all know, this has implications for corals because uh, they're going out of their zone of tolerance for temperature. So corals started to bleach. But with a higher water temperature, you have a more reduced dissolved oxygen availability in the water. OK, so lux is light or light penetration in the water. So in areas where it was polluted, as you can see, everyone, it was significantly lower in terms of light availability for photosynthetic organisms. So for corals and for sea grasses, there was an impact for UV light and there was an increased temperature on top of that. In the unpolluted areas, the availability of light was significantly greater and the temperature was in a range where corals are comfortable. Now, I'm just going to turn you over to this figure here. So this figure A and B, it looks rather complicated, but I shall simplify it. So what we've done here on the graph on A is we looked at the oxygen flux where there was sargassum on two different days. And basically what the take home message is with this figure is that the sargassum mat from the surface to the base of the sargassum mats on average is about half a meter or 50 centimeters. Now, at the base of the sargassum mat, where it's dark, as you can see here, the availability of light is low. So at the base of the sargassum mat, the algae is respiring. So what it's doing is actually utilizing oxygen, taking up oxygen. OK, so the availability of oxygen is much less. Now, what you can see here in the bottom graph. So what we have here is the edge of the sargassum map where you see lots of water mixing. And this is going into, shall we say, almost the center of the sargassum mat underneath it. OK, so you have this, the surface of the sargassum. Then you have this floating mat of about a meter thick. Then you have a little bit of water underneath. So eight meters from the edge of the sargassum mat and this blue dotted line, what you see is dissolved oxygen. And in actual fact, as you can see, it's very toxic. It's very anoxic for the environment. So no fish or invertebrates can survive because of the lack of oxygen in this area. OK, and you can see here, these bars here signify the sargassum thickness. And as you go towards the water edge, the ocean facing edge, the oxygen availability significantly increases because of water mixing. So it depends on the size of the actual mat as well. So here we have a final slide. So what this is doing here is looking at the growth of seagrass and its mass. OK, so. This is in Solomon Bay, okay? So this is growth rate of seagrass per day, right? Now, in this graph here, what you can see compared to Half Moon Bay and Yao Kool, the growth rate of seagrass was significantly reduced in Solomon Bay because of the impact of sargassum. And this was the same for in terms of the mass gained or the carbon biomass, as you know, Marine coastal vegetated ecosystems are vital, are vital not only for ecosystem services, for example, food provisioning, for mitigation against climate change, drawdown of carbon. And this is highlighting a significant reduction in the amount of carbon stored in those ecosystems due to the impact of sargassum. And here we have again from Solomon Bay to Yao Kool and Half Moon Bay, significantly reduced overall amount of availability of oxygen. And as we saw in the other graphs, increased temperature because of the impact and reduced sunlight. So the take home message is this, that there's a loss of community structure, a loss of biodiversity, also, a loss of connectivity and flow of energy going through these coastal ecosystems. There's a loss of productivity in terms of the amount of carbon drawdown from the atmosphere. And there's a loss of carbon biomass. And in actual fact, our data tell us 
that on average, seagrasses grow about two and a half times slower and there's about a seven times reduction in carbon biomass in areas where there's sargassum and, and it's leachate compared to areas where it's healthy. So the take home message is yes, it's great to have sargassum in the Sargasso Sea because of its massive carbon cycle, 7% of the total carbon flux of the ocean. So it's very important. But of course, the natural habitats in, should we say, the Southern Caribbean basin, where we have mangroves, where we have sea grasses, they also provide an important function, not only for carbon drawdown, but for the biodiversity and the functioning of the coastal ecosystems. And if we even think about uh, the biodiversity and the, the environment, let's think about tourism trade. So there's lots of issues that we need to consider here. And basically the take home message is, you don't want sargassum as an invasive species on your beach because it would just ruin the whole community structure. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, really, really insightful. And I think it, it, at least to me also in this learning journey, um, it shows that the problem which we envisioned at first from a sort of a smothering of beaches and tourism being affected, it, it shows a, a much bigger impact and therefore also a much bigger part of the opportunity to solve that problem in uh, using the sargassum for offsetting it uh, as, a, as a natural solution to our, uh, to our climate problem with a multipotent uh, yeah, set of options. As part of the uh, options of, of actually taking the sargassum, we're looking at processing it on land, and that is what Fons will talk about. And we also um, are looking at sinking it deep sea in emulating the, the Sargasso Sea Gyre and the whole dynamics there. So I think it's, it's good to move over to Dan. Um, if you yep. can start your share, Dan. Yeah, yeah right. sure, perfect. Right, two seconds. Uh, share. How are we looking? Does that look good? It does look good, yeah. Perfect, okie dokie. So we'll kind of move on. Bram kind of touched on it. He was saying um, uh, potentially sinking the sargassum to the deep and in order to kind of see that as a viable option, um, I've been looking into deep sea cycle and dynamics. So that's what uh, my presentation is going to be on today. Uh, short and sweet and hopefully you guys find it interesting. So move on to the first slide. So um deep sea cycles uh deep sea nutrient cycles are driven by productivity in the euphotic zone and they're also dependent on hydrology so the caribbean sea has oxygen rich bottom waters flowing in from the north atlantic and this fills up all five deep sea basins it results most likely in a stable oxic um, sea floor and then this knowledge gives us an idea of the diversity associated with these conditions so um it will most likely aid in sedimentation through dispersal of mats into thinner layers and through general bioturbation caused by fauna. So um, staying on cycles, sargassum is a huge producer in the euphotic zone. And it's important to look at what causes the natural sinking of this sargassum. So you can break down natural sinking into three main areas. You've got first the fragmentation um, of the weed clumps. So that's due to wave action. It results in the sinking of the older, more heavily encrusted portions of the algae. And the algae can become encrusted with species like um, bryozoans, so for instance, membranopora species and barnacles such as lepas species. Um, it's also interesting because when something grows on sargassum, the sargassum essentially becomes a transport to take um, these other organisms to the deep. So that's also something cool to look into. And it's an, also an important transport for carbonates. Um, then your second zone that you're looking at is disease sargassum. So that's if any of the air vesicles are affected, that obviously affects the buoyancy of sargassum and can cause it to sink. And then you've also got Langmuir circulation. So that neatly organizes sargassum into windrows and then effectively pulls it down to a depth where it's no longer buoyant. Um, once it starts sinking, it takes roughly 40 hours to, um, to reach the sea floor. Um, that was done in a study where they approximated the sea floor to be about 5,000 meters. So it, it kind of falls down to the sea floor extremely quickly. Um, we've then got these pictures down below. 
um, which show sedimented sargassum, it still shows its pigment. So again, that's another indicator that it's falling down extremely fast. Um, and then you've also got sargassum sinking to the sea bear playing a massive role in a benthic food web for obesopelagic organisms. This study that Fleury and Drazen did in 2013 actually found um, sargassum in the guts of echinoderms and some isopods. It just kind of shows direct use and again highlights that this is a natural phenomenon. We then move on to the next slide. On to deep sea dynamics. So roughly 90% of CO2 um, sequestration by macroalgae globally occurs through the export to the deep sea, um, but only about 24% of macroalgae at the surface reaches the sea floor at approximately 4,000 meters. So in order to maintain a stable deep sea ecosystem, a dynamic equilibrium between flux from the surface and dispersal um, slash sedimentation on and within the seabed has to exist. Um, next, it's important to look into seasonality of natural sargassum falls. So in spring, you tend to see new growth and separation from older clumps. And then in winter, you see the sinking of these older, heavier encrusted clumps. And that's supported by strong winds and deep mix layer in the Sargasso Sea during winter, um, which appear to enhance the sinking of these older encrusted clumps. I've then got these two diagrams here, uh, or these two figures that I pulled from two different studies, which also highlight the seasonality of um, Sargasso. So this first one, on the left is a 3,200 meter sediment trap looking at um, carbonate flux. So it's looking at uh, aragonite, magnesium, calcite, and just calcite. And as you can see, it supports that theory that there is more sinking in the winter um, there. And then we've also got this on the right. This figure shows um, seasonality again it also shows these massive standard deviations this was a study that was done over nine years um which is also helpful to show interannual variation so that's most likely uh, that's most likely linked to bloom sizes um and it also shows that there's um there's a big difference in um in bloom sizes when it comes to sargassum so to summarize um, I think I should probably say sargassum plays a huge role in both the deep sea cycles and dynamics. Um, sargassum could even play a potential role as a seasonal dynamic driver with deep sea species, life history potentially linked to these natural falls. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting topic. And that basically concludes my presentations. So if anybody's got any direct questions, feel, feel free to ask. Thank you, Dan. I think that 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 gives us a notion of, of sort of what's all involved, and also as 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 the, the 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 let's say the main topic for our study is okay. Is it a viable option for going into a deep sea sinking of the sargassum, which of course then first needs to be harvested? Is it viable? Then we need to understand that dynamic, and I think this gives great insight. Right, whether it's feasible, doable, and and. Hopefully we can actually, um, yeah, work towards that uh, that that type of mechanics or or, or dynamics to uh, to use the sargassum in that way, um, and that we're not going just over you know uh, thin ice because again the, the the risk of eutrophication and other effects are are rife. So we really need to study this uh, in in good way. Um, then with that, of course, we we do need uh, the infrastructure where we can keep it actually from washing ashore. Um, we, we need the infrastructure in terms of harvesting. Um, how do we bring it ashore? How do we you know, do all these things? So Ilko is gonna be um, discussing uh, that and, and hopefully Ilko, are you ready with uh, your uh, part yes, of this I'm presentation? Yes, I'm ready. Um, so about uh, 30 years ago, I, I sailed uh, on a big schooner from New York via Bermuda across the Atlantic Ocean. And then all of a sudden we saw this island <laughs> just in the middle of the ocean. It was a small island and uh, never seen it before, but it turned out to be a, to be a heap of uh, sargassum. So that was my first uh, encounter with uh, sargassum. Now in this project, uh, we have a, a couple of questions we want to answer. And some of the questions are related to 
the uh, maritime uh, technological solutions uh, that are needed. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, uh, this, this uh, picture is uh, of a piece of equipment that was developed more than 100 years ago and to, uh, to harvest seaweed that was in, the, in, in that time was being used as a fertilizer, for instance, uh, on a lot of time. And um, so what, we, what we're really investigating now is uh, uh, a couple of uh, elementary questions. Uh, one is where to collect the sargassum. Uh, could, be, could be done onshore or just offshore or mere, more out at sea. And then there's a couple of uh, practicalities like uh, what's the distance to port, uh, what's the needed seaworthiness mm -hmm. of a vessel, etc. The expenses, of course, is important and the time that's, that is uh, needed. And then uh, the ecosystem, uh, as said before, uh, among others by uh, Bram, Bram, there's uh, the uh, sarg floating sargassum is an important sea, uh, uh, ecosystem for certain species. And then uh, we have some next steps that will be dealt uh, later, uh, how to process where and how to process the sort of end product as I uh, like to call it now. So right now, uh, a lot of the island states in the Caribbean, they have a lot of problems with the uh, sargassum and uh, they don't usually, they don't have uh, the, the, uh, a lot of equipment. As you can see, for instance, here, this is on Bonaire. There's a lot of people just picking it up by hand with uh, surfboards, etc., carrying it to the beach, and then it's picked up by uh, by a piece of equipment. Uh, as as here, for instance, there's also uh, there's a lot of hand picking going on. But uh, so in some islands, they're using uh, more sophisticated uh, equipment, but uh, that can cause some problems as well because then. You know, um, uh, this equipment, um, more like a bulldozer uh, type of equipment, can take all the life forms that are in the, uh, in the, on the beach and also take a lot of sand with it. So that's not, uh, usually not the, the, right, uh, the right way to do it. And uh, uh, this was, uh, uh, there's a lot of work done by the Dutch um, uh, Caribbean Nature Association about uh, uh, the conditions for collecting and uh, some of the conditions um, are for instance is that you always have to check for marine species and um, especially trapped sea turtles but also fish fishes etc etc and uh, the, uh, uh, the there are certain uh, there's certain requirements for for the types of vessels, vessels as well. And those are uh, those uh, pre-requirements, they're really, really important. And uh, what it also says is that the ideal machine to remove sargassum, sargassum does not yet exist. So that will be part of our research. How could we design uh, a good uh, and sort of ideal piece of equipment? Now, these are some, uh, some examples of uh, pieces of equipment, floating equipment that uh, got, come in the right uh, direction. Uh, it's a sort of a small, uh, small vessels with a, um, a conveyor belt that, you know, actually sail across the sea and it picks it up and it scoops it up and puts it into, into the hull of the ship. And... Uh, that can contain quite a bit of sargassum and that can then be taken later uh, in port. Uh, now, usually these small boats uh, can only be used in, uh, in quiet waters. So typically on island states in the Caribbean, there's one part that, is, that can be really rough that's on the eastern side of the islands. And uh, usually these, uh, this type of equipment can not be used there but it can be used on the other side on the western part of the island now there's also uh booms being used like uh the picture on the on the right hand uh, the right hand upper corner and booms uh, are also being used for instance to prevent uh oil spills to uh to float towards the beaches and these booms 
might be used in, uh, in some sort of way uh, also perhaps in conjunction with, uh, with uh, certain types of boats. Now, the, the picture on the, on the lower right-hand corner is a design that was done by uh, a Dutch uh, shipping company, uh, shipbuilding company called Damen. Uh, it, hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been executed yet, but that might be, uh, that might be a, a good option. So have a barge with um, a conveyor belt Picking it, picking it up, but also a processing plant and a big barge next to it to further transport uh, the uh, orgasm. That could be a solution. Now, of course, we are uh, we're just at the start of this project, and we're really looking for solutions from uh, from people here in this event, for instance. But maybe, so if you have any, uh, any sort of ideas about how to develop this further, <coughs> please let us know now or later uh, via email, for instance. And this is the end of my presentation. So if there's any questions, uh, shoot. Mm. Okay. Maybe we can, uh, Ilko, thank you for, um, for this. It, it gives a great overview of what was already happening, but also, let's say, the limitations of what is happening uh, and, and where we need to, to focus our efforts on. Um, once we have harvested, in terms of how we're exactly going to do that, is, of course, the question we just got from Ilko. But Fons is looking at what can we actually do with the uh, sargassum and how can we valorize the... Um, yeah, the contents of the uh, of the seaweed. So, with that, Fons, over to you. Yes. Good evening, everybody. My name is Fons. Uh, I'm 24 years old. I'm right now a graduating student in biotechnology from the Leiden University. So, from uh, May to December, I will be the intern to really need look into the technicalities how to process it. And this presentation will highlight like uh, my like halfway outcomes. Uh, regarding energy materials and fertilizers. So the first option is anaerobic digestion. Uh, what you would see here in the left right corner, in the right upper corner is also such a boat in action that Ilko mentioned. Um, you also see that with anaerobic digestion, you could do that on land, so you ship it on land, but you could also, one study showed that you could also do it maybe halfway in the sea. Um, so that the, saw, the seaweed sargassum gets decomposed and digested. So the bacteria, they, without oxygen, they eat the sargassum and they form methane, which can be used for biogas, and that can get be, uh, be brought to shore. Um, and if you do it halfway, a few hundred meters in the sea, um, the pressure makes it that the methane will still go up, whereas the CO2 gets dissolved in the water. So then you do, need, do not need that much of a cleaning step. But that means that also the CO2 gets dissolved in the ocean, which will make it more acidic. So you would like to prevent it by having a kind of kelp uh, or seaweed next to it growing that absorbs the CO2 to, um, um, to undo that problem. And potentially you could combine this also down with the sinkage after the residue um, is not further anymore digested. So um, that's the positive thing of uh, what we can further research. The, the disadvantage is that there is a small yield currently with anaerobic digestion that has mainly to do with the phenolics, which is a chemical compound used for communication and for growth. Uh, these are secondary metabolites at the sargassum species. And bacteria often do not really like them and are not able to grow that much on it in the, in the laboratories to, um, to look into the methane production potential. Another option would be to use supercritical water gasification. It's a complete different process to, um, to obtain methane, but also hydrogen. So supercritical water is, a, is another phase. So you've got gas and you've got water, but if you really use high pressures and high uh, temperatures, you get into the supercritical state so that has a, some advantages that a lot of these things get de decomposed. So you, you can not only use um, sargassum, but also basic plastics or other bio waste. 
Um, and these salts um, potentially can give corrosion because in supercritical water, the digestion, the solubility of salts is lower. But that could also be an opportunity because then you remove the salts already before you do the decomposing. Problem, well, a research question is still to scale up with it. In the Netherlands, there is a scale up company called SCW Systems that is actually doing um, like a medium scale super water, critical water gasification, and that might be interesting for uh, suggesting. Uh, the second category is uh, materials, and the good thing, the potential of materials, is that you can also use it for carbon storage. And the current applications uh, are existing with some artisan um, entrepreneurs. Uh, so one person in Mexico built a house made of sargassum, and there is also a, an entrepreneur in a French island in the Caribbean that's making paper out of it. And as I told you, the phenolics, they do not li like, they cause that the bacteria do not like to compose it, uh, but it could actually also be used as a benefit on the paper to be bioactive and prevent food to be, um, uh, to be infected by bacteria or or fungi, so that it stays longer well. Um, the question, of course, of bricks is indeed what are the mechanical properties, because uh, seaweed does not have the same uh, structure as plants on land do. And the last option uh, we are looking into is the use of fertilizers. As Pedram already mentioned in the comments, is that the arsenic level is quite high. Arsenic is a heavy metal, which can cause the, um, problems uh, with health in, for human consumption, but also in ecosystems. So um, one would need to use maybe bioremediation. So you use plants that can absorb the, the heavy metals when you want to use it as a fertilizer. So you bring the sargassum on land, you mix it with other bio, bio waste. So you have the good composition regarding nitrogen and regarding carbon content and other micronutrients. Uh, um, and you can use certain plants that specifically can pick up the arsenic. And a few uh, potential plants will be that are not used for food, could be maybe bamboo, hemp, or agave. So, and from these products, you can make uh, like ropes or uh, textiles or like construction material, in, at least in any case that the arsenic compounds are not doing any harm. Um, so, in, yeah, in conclusion, you can make an, potential energy out of it, materials are used as fertilizers um, for agriculture, and that maybe after multiple rounds of uh, maybe bamboo, you could uh, grow food crops on it again because all the heavy metals are in it. So thank you for listening.